We stopped the last time at 2.38 of the Yoga Sutras and we continue from there. If you may recall, we talked about the various results or benefits of the Yamas and we were discussing the results and benefits of the Niyamas. What we're calling results and benefits could also be called siddhis or accomplishments or some sort of powers. And the yamas especially uh, are when we internalize these, they result in some very beautiful accomplishments but only when they are really internalized. It's not about blindly following a rule, a rigid rule, because rigid rules make for an army. It's very good when you're in the military, but it's not what a yogi is. Following rigid rules doesn't make you into a yogi. It will make you into a very obedient person, but it doesn't make you into a yogi. Yogis are very, very strong-minded people. Those who are obedient are not. Obedient people are not necessarily strong. So having given the background, once again, we dive into Sutra 2.39, which is where we left off, and discuss the next Niyama, which is Aparigraha. Sorry, is that another one? Yes. <clears throat> Sorry, it's the Yama. You're still at the Yamas. And this is the very last one. So, Aparigraha, on attaining steadiness in non possessiveness one acquires complete understanding of birth, death, and the mysteries of life. When it talks about birth here, the word is janma. Janma also implies death and all the mysteries of life. It's talking about this plane of existence. How is it possible that attaining steadiness and non-possessiveness can give us understanding of this state of existence. Well, when you understand non-possessiveness to be an attitude of not mine, not mine. This is not mine. It is a attitude of vairagya. One who has attained Perfect non-attachment is non-possessive, acquires understanding of this world, of this life, and all the mysteries of life and death. It will help you resolve all the questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going from here? How can I be happy? How can I overcome suffering and pain? So you can see that what appears to be a mere instruction not to collect too much baggage is in fact a very profound idea. Do not get attached to things and people in relationships, for example, because the things we get attached to or that we are close to are the ones that give us pain. This does not mean that you do not relate to people anymore or do not enjoy objects. That would, that would not be vairagya or non-possessiveness. That would be tyaga. One who is truly non-possessive can enjoy those things as well as relationships even more fully and completely.
We can take the example of an apartment. If you have a rented home and you are not owning it, you still enjoy it. You are still enjoying the benefits of being in that rented apartment. But you know very well that it doesn't belong to you. Right? So, in a sense, this world is like a hotel or a camp. And you come here, you stay for a while, you enjoy it. But you should not get attached to it. Don't start owning things. Don't develop a sense of ownership, especially in relationships. You get very possessive about a person, your child, for example. That's when the problems start. Suffering comes from those people who we, whom we get attached to. So Aparigraha is the attitude of not mine, not mine. None of this is mine. Having gone through all the yamas, I would like to say that all the yamas are like gateways. They are gateways to enlightenment or liberation. And when we say mastery or siddhi in that yama, it doesn't mean the rigid approach to that yama. So we talk about being truthful. Truthfulness doesn't mean just being honest. It has a far deeper meaning, as we discussed in our previous session. But Brahmacharya has a far deeper meaning than merely being celibacy. So Brahmacharya is when one walks in Brahman, one has gone above the dualities. You're not thinking in terms of male and female. You see people as consciousness, and such a master enjoys virya rasa. Virya rasa is the attitude of a hero or a veer, a conqueror. He has conquered dualities. Only such a teacher can really teach you Brahma Vidya, that is, the knowledge of the universal self. So all these yamas are gateways. It doesn't matter which door you open, they all lead to that highest. So through this subtle understanding and integration of these principles of the yamas, one can attain the highest. And mostly, we cannot attain these kind of subtle insights these principles cannot be really integrated if we have not gone through some advanced dhyana and purification. As I said, it's not merely imposing it on oneself. It comes from within. And it can come from within only through a deep meditative practice. Any questions so far on the yamas? Any comments on yamas? The yamas were ahimsa, non-violence, satya, honesty, or truth, non-stealing, brahmacharya, and aparigraha. Any questions? Any thoughts on this? before we continue to the Niyamas. Those of you who do not have background noise can also unmute yourself and ask or speak or discuss if you like. Okay, everybody seems to be happy. 
<clears throat> then we go to the next one and now we are starting the niyamas so the first niyama as most of you know is saucha cleanliness and practice a saucha through physical purification of the limbs one realizes that the body is gross and loses interest in his own body as well as that of others. Physical purification, simply cleanliness, taking care of your body, of the limbs of the body. One begins to realize that the body is continuously changing and disintegrating. The more you busy yourself with the body, the more you realize that the body is constantly disintegrating and that the body is not permanent. And this leads to lesser attachment to the body because you realize that the body is gross, it's not permanent. And when we are less attached to our own bodies, when we begin to see clearly that the body is gross and impermanent, we are also not as attached to the body of others. Which means that this physical attraction would also reduce. The emphasis on external appearances would reduce. So this coloring, of appearances, you know, the external looks, this reduces significantly. And when we talk about body, we're not talking merely about our own physical body or the body of others, as in physical bodies, but the entire Anna Maya Kosha. Anna Maya Kosha is this world. It's made of five elements, just like our physical bodies are made of five elements. So, our attachment to all things that are physical reduces because there is less, lesser attachment to that which is impermanent. And when the attachment reduces, the coloring reduces, essentially. So physical purification, what is physical purification? What is saucha? At the physical level, it is simply things like dietary changes, lifestyle choices, how you live, how you keep your surroundings clean, neat. All these things are part of physical purification. Physical purification, especially also of the body itself through dietary changes and lifestyle choices, including the yamas, also have a marked impact on the biochemistry of the body. And this also is a part of purification or saucha. Any thoughts or questions regarding the physical aspect of saucha? Okay, so I just wanted to make a short announcement. Some of you have uh, having have had difficulties to uh, buy my book, Mastering Pranayam. Some of you who are located in non-English speaking countries have had difficulties. Even some people from Canada had some issues. Um, it seems that the link that I put out doesn't always work. Um, and the best way to find the book is to just search for Mastering Pranayam, uh, type in the author name, Radhika Shah Groovan, or just Groovan, and you should find it. 
it is available worldwide even though the link might say this book is not available in your country so if that should happen just search for it directly and uh, make sure that you're logged into your local Amazon store. So the next verse is verse 41. From a sattvic mind, through mental purification, arises pleasantness of feeling, one-pointedness, mastery over the senses, and qualification for self-realization. So you see the first verse, verse 40, talks about physical purification. Verse 41 talks about mental purification. So you need to have a sattvic mind, sattvic buddhi. <clears throat> a sattvic buddhi leads to a one-pointed mind. Now, there's a misunderstanding about one-pointed mind. A lot of people think one-pointed mind is just trying to concentrate on something, whatever the object of concentration may be. So if you're trying to concentrate on your breath, you only think of the breath and nothing but the breath. Yes, technically speaking, that's correct. But how many of us are able to do that? In practice, what happens is that when you're focusing on the breath, there are all sorts of thoughts which come and disturb you. Suddenly, you're thinking about, I have to go now and purchase something from the supermarket. Or now I have to feed my, I don't know, my dog. Or I have to water the plants. And so the moment you try to concentrate, the mind seems to come up with things to distract and disturb you. And these are conflicts. The mind is then torn apart by conflicts. You are conflicting contradictory thoughts which are disturbing you. And that is not a state of one-pointedness. That is a state of a divided mind or a distracted mind. So to have a purified mind, first you have to train the senses, learn to resolve the conflicts. You can do that through the practice of internal dialogue that we talked about last, last week, where we said that Pratipaksha Bhavana, which is mentioned in the Yoga Sutras, is nothing other than internal dialogue or it was called in the Vedantic literature, it's called Nididhyasana, Manan, Vichar, different words for the same thing. And this helps us resolve our contradictory and conflicting thoughts, feelings and desires. And when we have a certain state of one-pointedness, then it is possible to go really deep and such a mind is qualified for self-realization. A divided mind is not qualified for self-realization. So in order to know the self, in order to go beyond dualities, one needs to have, have gone through the process of mental purification. This part, the mental purification part, is often skipped. People don't want to go through that because it's not a very pleasant process initially. When you go through it, it becomes pleasant. See, that's one of the results. Then arise feelings of pleasantness. But before that, it is pretty unpleasant because you see your conflicts and you have to put in a lot of energy to resolve these conflicts. So this second part of Sautra, of cleanliness or purification, is just ignored very often. And people focus on the physical aspect, which is very good, but is not enough. 
one has to go through the second part in order to really progress to overcome one's suffering as well as disease. One of the biggest reasons for disease, I would go so far as to say, chronic disease. The reason for chronic disease is conflicts. Internal conflicts that have not been resolved leads to stress. And so this creates a lot of tension, pressure inside within the mind and the body and causes disease. Any questions about mental purification? Fortunately, this part of the Yoga Sutras is easier to follow. It's not as difficult as some of the other parts. And it is also a little bit practical and we can relate to it in our lives. So right now, the session is not very heavy. Verse 42 is about contentment or santosha. From unsurpassed contentment, happiness is gained. I don't think I really have to really um, speak much about this. That should be pretty clear. And contented, to be contented means to be happy with less. So if you have fewer desires... If the coloring is not so strong, if you're not so super ambitious, then it's natural that you will be happier. You're just simply content with less. So this really depends on your character, your personality. And when you do some mental purification, which came right before, you will find that you will resolve contradictory desires, resolve contradictory emotions, and that will lead to more clarity about what you want from your life. So mental purification, Santosh, also help us Understand what we really want from our lives and help us focus. That's what one-pointedness means, resolving conflicts. Verse 43 is about tapas. Destruction of impurities by self-discipline or tapas brings about perfection of body and senses. First of all, the word tapas very often um, creates um, a disturbance in the minds of some people because it seems to indicate austerities. In many places, it has been translated as austerities which immediately brings to mind pictures of, of yogis in loincloths walking over a bed of nails, burning um, coal, um, you know, torturing themselves um, by putting their hands up for, for, you know, many years and until their arms atrophy, the muscles atrophy. So 
This is not what is meant here. It is not tapas. Tapas, the word comes also from fire, tapa. is heat, generation of heat, the heat of discipline. It doesn't mean something that is, um, it's not self-torture. It is a healthy discipline. Discipline always has, I find it, it's like a razor's edge. You can very easily fall to either side, either too little discipline or too much, too rigid, too strict, or too lax. If it is too strict, it is very self-destructive and harmful. And if it's too lax, then what happens is basically nothing. Nothing happens. You don't grow. You don't evolve. You don't progress. So self-discipline in a balanced way leads to destruction of impurities. Which impurities are we talking about? mental impurities. As we talked about, the physical impurities or physical cleanliness is quite easy to achieve. But the mental purities, that requires some kind of discipline. And how does this lead to a perfect body? Perfection of body and senses does not mean that you're going to look like Mr. Universe or, or Miss Universe. What it means is health, freedom from disease, energy is flowing, there are no obstacles. Obstacles are created by impurities or conflicts in the mind. When there are no conflicts, energy flows. When energy flows, the body is healthy, it's free of disease. And this is achieved through training of senses and discipline of the mind. And for that, we need to understand how. How we can do that is um, by, perhaps I'll show you this thing here. I don't know. Yes, it appears here. Yeah. Here we are. So some of you know it already. We have looked at it before. These are the aspects of the mind and I'm trying to enlarge it but somehow it doesn't work. Okay. Can't seem to enlarge it. <clears throat> so we have four aspects. We have buddhi, manas, ankara and chitta. So you resolve conflicts by making sure that these four are all moving in the same direction, that they are coordinated. When this happens, there is a flow of energy. If your voice of wisdom tells you to do something, but your senses, led by manas, drags you off somewhere else and distracts you, then you're not going to achieve that. So let me take an example. If you're a student and you want to do well in your studies, you want to you have the ambition, say, of, of being the best in your class. And your voice of wisdom tells you, yes, you should work hard and you need to study for two hours every day. But manners and the senses, they want to go out and play. They want to have fun with other friends. Chitta, the memories, they put up all images, oh, the other friends are enjoying, and you have this picture of all your other friends enjoying. And so there are conflicts created in the mind because these four aspects of the mind are going in different directions. Right? So you need to resolve the conflict. And when the conflict is resolved, perhaps you have a conversation with your mind and you, you tell your mind, Okay, you can have fun, but after you have studied for two hours. When you've studied, you can reward yourself. And in that way, you can resolve a conflict. 
And this is a kind of discipline that you have now created for yourself. If the discipline is too rigid, where you have a target that is really hard to achieve, it makes it very difficult for the conflict to be resolved. So if Ahankara says here, your ego says, oh, two hours, you need to study for six hours, you can do it. And then Ahankara has imposed this rigid discipline and said six hours. But that's too tough for the senses. It, it's just going berserk. It wants to go out and the, the chitta has all these memories flooding in of the friends enjoying themselves. And Buddhi says, hey, that six hours is too much, but who's listening? Because Ahankara has created this very rigid discipline. So you can see that we need to have a balance here. And discipline really means training of these four aspects of the mind in a way that is gentle and still firm. We can go back to our Next. So that was about self-discipline and how this helps us create a healthy body, healthy senses. Of course, discipline here includes something at the physical level. So we talked about sorcha at a physical level. So we also talk about tapas at a physical level. But once again, word of caution, it does not mean practicing dynamic asanas for hours, torturing the body and that kind of discipline is, is not required. That, is, that can be even unhealthy. Body has its limits. The body is disintegrating all the time. You cannot prevent that. But keep the body in good health with the right amount of exercise, movement, Cleanliness combined with meditation and resolution of internal conflicts will bring about a very healthy state of mind and body. When you have such a disciplined mind, which is one-pointed, you also acquire certain other cities, cities like clairvoyance, you know, being able to... Um, tell the future. And that is also one of the Siddhis. There are many others which we will come to in our next sessions. But good health is always very nice to have, both mental as well as physical. Any questions regarding self-discipline or tapas? Okay, then we go to verse 44. Through Swadhyaya, or self-awareness, communion with the desired deity is attained. First of all, let's understand the word Swadhyaya. Swa means self. Dhyaya comes the same root as Dhyana. That means focusing on paying attention to, being aware of. Therefore, Swadhyaya means self-awareness. In many places, it's simply called self-study or sometimes even study. Studying intellectual books or scriptures is useful. Maybe it's good to a certain extent, but it's not sufficient. It will not lead to real accomplishment. It will not lead you to mental peace. So 
instead of dissipating energies and studying others, this is what happens very often, we start observing other people and finding ways that they can change and improve themselves instead of observing themselves. They're studying others. So turn the attention from the outward focus to inward focus and become self-aware. Observe your own negative traits, positive traits, your strengths, your weaknesses. And this will lead you towards communion. Communion, the word is, Sanskrit word is samprayog. Communion is more than just communication. It's a kind of merging together. So you have a complete understanding of you have the word communion is union is the same as sampra yog yog is union right so it's a very powerful word whether we say it in english communion or sampra yog is really merging with the deity why deity as we become self-aware, we become aware of the different layers we have. So we have our waking consciousness, and we all are in our waking consciousness right now. Unless some of you have fallen asleep, if you have, then you would be in other states of consciousness, that is dreaming and deep sleep. And deity. Or has different meanings. It means a celestial being. It also means a quality. Let's take a deity that all of us are familiar with. Most of you know the deity Ganesha. Ganesha is the elephant head god. Many of you are familiar with that deity. You can take any deity. You can also take. Um, from other traditions, Jesus, for example, or any object of worship. And you see, for example, Ganesh. What are the qualities of an elephant? He has an elephant's head. What are the qualities? The qualities of an elephant are gentleness, yet at the same time very strong. He is said to have a very good memory. Elephants are supposed to be wise. They are very powerful that even carnivores like tigers, lions, have a tremendous respect for the elephant. They are very sensitive animals and very social animals as well. So when you think about this deity, he has these qualities. And so, communion with the deity of your choice means you open a channel for these qualities. And in this way, you can acquire the object of your desires. So if you desire to be wise and have an intuition, the de deity is the elephant-headed god, Ganesh. The Yoga Sutras is not advocating us to start worshipping deities because, and this is why I explained that a deity here actually means the qualities. So you do not necessarily have to focus on the external object as in a statue of Ganesha. You just have to focus your mind on these qualities that you desire. It's a finer practice. And those who cannot do the finer practice, they are the ones that are given then a slightly more appealing form of Ganesha that in that, that personifies these qualities. So remember that any deity is personifying qualities. So if you think about Jesus, then it's qualities of 
love and compassion. If you think about Buddha, there's a lot of compassion there also. So in Sanatana Dharma, there are so many deities, innumerable deities, because we have so many qualities. So you can choose the qualities that you desire and acquiring this self-awareness leads to communion, which means your, your awareness is expanded and insights come pouring in. In India, for example, it's very common also that people worship the goddess Lakshmi or uh, other forms of Lakshmi who is the goddess of prosperity. So the desired quality is prosperity. And wealth does not mean just financial wealth, but it means wealth of all kinds. Health, friends, family, mental peace, all of these are qualities of prosperity. And when these insights start pouring in through self-study, you attain communion with the deity. It means you acquire these qualities. Any questions about Swadhyaya? Okay, in that case, we continue with verse 2.45, which is the last of the niyamas. You know that the last three niyamas, that is, Tapas, Swadhyaya, and Ishwar Pranidhan, are aspects of Kriya Yoga. That's the action that you perform. So you must have self discipline, self awareness, and then Expansion of awareness, these are the aspects of Kriya Yoga. So, verse 45 talks about Ishwar Pranidhana. Ishwar means the divine, it means God, it means Atman, universal consciousness, and Pranidhan means the base or foundation. It also means expansion. So there are many meanings of pranidhan. It also means expansion. With complete expansion of awareness, or Ishwar pranidhan, one attains samadhi, the highest state of wonder or an infinite wisdom. So this is a very profound sutra here. Ishwar pranidhan has often been translated as surrender. Fortunately, we don't know what surrender really means. Surrender to what? Surrender to whom? Should we surrender to a deity? Should we surrender to a teacher? We are not comfortable with the idea of surrendering to a teacher. In our modern life, we have we are all educated people, we are adults, and just blindly following someone can also lead to some can lead us into trouble. So what is meant by surrender? It's a very unclear word, and I'm afraid it's not a very good translation. It seems to indicate almost something a bit religious in the sense of devotion. In reality, pranidhan means expansion. It's expanding into universal consciousness. And with this complete expansion or opening the channel which we talked about in the earlier sutra, to certain qualities. You can open this channel by expanding it further to infinite wisdom. You attain samadhi, the state of wonder, state of awe, state of infinite wisdom. Well, this is also a siddhi, because 
when you can expand your choir, because samadhi is a siddhi, and with that come many other, many other accomplishments. You begin to see things as they are, and such a person is now. It's difficult to relate to such a person. Most of the time, we are relate our relations with people is all about project projecting things from ourselves. So, if you feel um, if you are very happy in your life, you assume that everybody is happy. If you are sad and miserable, you think everybody is sad and miserable. So most of the time we see through our eyes a reality that is distorted, distorted by our own coloring. But here, now you see things as they are and you have expanded to universal consciousness. It's a heightened awareness that is very difficult to imagine. The only thing that is, one can relate to it is when you think about a time when perhaps you were in something like an accident or some moment of time where you went through maybe extreme pain or a um, very difficult situation when, for example, in the accident, things seem to slow down and you have a kind of heightened awareness and everything appears to be going in slow motion. Why does it appear in slow motion? Because of heightened awareness. You have expanded your awareness. The body does this in moments of danger. It floods the brain with certain hormones and certain chemical substances which are in the brain, which increase this awareness, and makes it very high, to save you from that dangerous position so that you are faster. So things seem to slow down. In reality, they haven't, but your reaction time can be faster. So this heightened awareness in times of danger are a little bit like the experience of samadhi. Imagine being like that all the time. You can see things differently. You see things that others do not register. Now the awareness is expanded to such an extent that you know your deepest layers, the causal plane as well. Causal plane is deep sleep. And you know all the glaciers, the samskaras that are stored there, these little seeds. You saw the little seeds uh, right in the beginning of the session with the, with the tree there. And the roots of the tree are in the unconscious mind. That's where all the seeds are. And now with this expanded awareness, you become fully aware even of the causal plane. It doesn't mean that you have attained kevalya, complete freedom. It means that there's an opening, the channel is now open, you've got these glimpses, maybe you fall back, the channel closes again, and that's when you need to have regular practice, daily practice, systematic practice. That's when you might come to the conclusion, oh, okay, I need a teacher. Maybe I need somebody who guides me so that I can systematically get here. If you just happen to experience one of these fleeting samadhis, you had this expansion of awareness which was just momentary. And then it closed again. If that happens, then you may want to look for a teacher or find some way of having a systematic practice so that you can get there faster, easier, without trying to experiment yourself and wasting away years of time just 
trying to create your own practice when it's all been done for you. So this verse ends the section on the niyamas. So we went through the five niyamas, and just as the yamas were gateways to the higher state, so are the niyamas. They also give us certain cities, and they're also gateways to the higher state. And we can practice them individually. We can try to integrate these by practicing meditation and understanding these at a far deeper level, exploring the layers of these in the mind and integrating these. Any questions or thoughts about Vishwa Pranidhan? Okay, then our next group of verses are based on asana. It's interesting that modern yoga has such a strong focus on asanas and most of the times these asanas are dynamic asanas there's a lot of movement, there's, it's almost like gymnastics. And here, when we talk about asanas, we're not talking about dynamic postures. We're talking about static, steady postures. And it's interesting that in the entire Yoga Sutras, there are only three verses on asana. So the first verse on asanas, that's verse 46, says, Asana, posture should be steady or stirth and comfortable or sukham. Stir sukham asanam, that means uh, posture should be steady and comfortable. So if uh, you're very dynamic, you're practicing dynamic postures, so a lot of movement, how does that work with steady posture? Obviously, steady is not dynamic. So this verse indicates the fact that we are talking about static, steady postures and not dynamic postures. These dynamic postures may be useful for health, but they are not going to lead to mental purification, one-pointed mind. And here we are talking about the steady postures. Now, there are two kinds of postures in the steady postures. One is the, the cultural postures and the other is the meditative postures. What are cultural postures? Cultural posture means that which cultivates, therefore cultural postures. And cultural postures have bhavas or attitudes. There are four basic bhavas. Dharma, which means integrity, authenticity. Jnana, which is knowledge. Vairagya, non-attachment. Aishwarya means confidence or strength. Now, any static posture creates a certain attitude and you cultivate this attitude. 
So if you sit in Siddhasan, Sukhasan, you're cultivating knowledge or jnana. If you sit in Yoga Mudra, bend forward, it's a sense of Vairagya. If you perform asanas like Ustrasana, the camel pose, Mayuras and the peacock pose, these give you a lot of power. Sense of Ashwarya is developed. So all asanas can be divided into these four categories, depending on the kind of bhava or attitude that is cultivated. Dynamic postures, on the other hand, have no bhava. You don't cultivate anything. And if you do cultivate anything, the only thing you are cultivating is a kind of distorted version of Aishwarya, that is confidence. So it's very one-sided. There is no balance. So we need to cultivate all these cultural asanas with the right attitude so that we have a balanced approach to the asanas. The next verse is verse 47, also on asanas. But I think it might be a good idea to stop here because I would like to spend a little bit more time explaining these two next two verses on asanas and uh, not just kind of rush through that. So it's probably best to stop here and continue the next time. So it was nice to have everybody. Please let me know if you have questions. You can also write to me um, either on my email or if you are my befriended me on Facebook, you can write me a message. So if you have um, any personal questions but you're not able to ask here, you can also write to me. And it's nice to have everybody here. So bye-bye. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Thank you, Perry. The same to you. Bye-bye, Nita, Debbie, Palaji. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye. Bye-bye, Nita, Rajan. Thank you, Ms. Rajan. Thank you.